and we're live gang hey uh nice to see you i'm jake roberts this is the ghost of bacon uh <clears throat> already looking at uh, we have a whole stream of comments popping up here already um several live viewers good to see you all this evening um i uh ran into difficulty putting on the um event on facebook this week i, I have no idea what what's been going on but uh, the facebook goblins have been really at me uh hey pen glad you could make it amy carolyn cat ao good to see all you guys tom i saw you in there zantlo um thanks for joining us tonight guys um so i'm, I'm excited about this this episode because um this information came to me right out of left field and uh um, as, as many of you know, I've, I've talked about this idea on, on the podcast before. Um, now that, you know, I've, I've been putting this information out uh, in the public for uh, a couple of years, uh, I, I get a lot of people contacting me. And um, hi, Judy. Dan, good to see you, my friend. Barbara, thanks so much. Um, you know, I, I, I get contacted by people frequently uh, who either claim they, they have information or or claim to have found a cipher and, and, you know, ask my input. And, you know, I, I always kind of do the same thing off more times than not. Um, they really haven't found anything. Um, and you know, and that's unfortunate, but I, I try to encourage them. I, I, I don't, you know, poo poo anything anyone says, I, I don't shoot them down. I just encourage them to keep on going, keep on looking. And, you know, eventually you're, they're going to, you know, figure it out and find something. And so, uh, when this next gentleman, uh, who's, who's my guest this evening, Ryan Plaster, um, when he reached out to me and, and his, his friend, Greg, uh, and Greg, I know you're watching this evening. Um, I, I was, I really didn't know what to say. Uh, when someone contacts you and, and says, Hey, I found Sir Francis, the, well, I'll let him speak for himself, but he believes he found the tomb of Sir Francis Bacon, as well as the resting place of the Ark of the Covenant in the Ozarks in Arkansas. And so you, you, you get these kinds of messages and, um, I, I always take a deep breath and, and think, um, well, listen, uh, you know, I am on my podcast every other week, uh, usually, um, <clears throat> saying outrageous things, right. Uh, you know, there, there are people who, uh, right to this day, even though I have mountains of evidence, uh, showing that Sir Francis Bacon used the alias, and he calls it his best alias of Samuel de Champlain, people refuse to look at it because it sounds so crazy. And I get it. You know, I, 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 I sympathize with the people who are criticizing me for making that statement when they refuse, even when they refuse to look at the evidence. Um, so, you know, that's all well and good. And so when someone tells me uh, that they've decrypted a cipher that has led them to a site in Arkansas, and then goes on to tell me, uh, well, here's what I found and sends me pictures. Um, you know what? Uh, so often, you know, people <clears throat> refuse to listen or even look at the evidence just because they, you know, at first glance, they just cast it off. Uh, I, I, I try to lend an ear and say, oh, well, okay, show me what you found. And this gentleman is so sincere and, and um, so earnest that... He says, I really want to come on your podcast and, and show it. I said, great. Let, let's take a look at your information. Let's take a look at it and um, see what you have. So that's that's the spirit of, of this evening's show. I, I want to give uh, Ryan a real uh, <clears throat> fair listen. So keep keep an open mind uh, at what he has. And, and Dave, yeah, once again, you hit the nail on the head there. Um, he says, real science looks at all evidence. If you block evidence out, you're not a scientist at all. Absolutely. And, you know, we see this all the time. And um, so with all of that said, I want to introduce my uh, new friend to you, uh, Ryan Plaster. Welcome hey. to Ghost of Bacon, my friend. Uh, so I, I just gave a little uh, quick uh, preview uh, explaining that, uh, you know, you and Greg reached out to me and um, and I, I, I'm contacted by people frequently. Uh, who claim they have found a cipher, and uh, more times than not, they haven't. Um, and, and when you started showing me some of the stuff that you found, and then the way that you, um, your, your command of, of uh, the plays in the first folio, and your command of the scriptures in, in the 1611 King James, um, I, I was duly impressed. And um, 
And so, you know, when we, I, I talked about how, you know, I, I make really big claims on the show, right? Um, you know, the, the ciphers I've decrypted and, and the, the uh, things I've discovered about Sir Francis Bacon as a result of them, uh, I, I don't say that they change history, they actually reveal history. Um, and so I, I, I see um, <clears throat> the, the way I look at those things and I say these things, I know how people view what I say and kind of roll their eyes and refuse to look at the evidence. And so when someone like you comes in and says, hey, I think I found the Ark of the Covenant, um, I'm like, okay, show me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep an open mind. I'm gonna say, I, I wanna see what you have. So um, thanks for joining us. I'm really excited uh, to um, share with everyone what you, what you found. Um, so go ahead and introduce yourself. How did you get involved in this? And uh, uh, where are we gonna go from here? Yes, thank you for having me on. Um, it's 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 been a long time uh, trying to get somebody to listen. Like you said, most people just reject you, and they don't look at the evidence that's being. Uh, they they have a very difficult time processing information, and it's just a uh, it's unfortunate. But um, a lot of people today have a hard time, difficulty even processing what they read, and if you can't do that, then then you're really left outside. True. And um, so I appreciate you letting me be able to do this. Um, how it started for me was um, I was 30 years old and I heard a voice and it spoke to me as like an audible voice, like when me and you were talking and it said, open your eyes. And I spent seven years looking for that voice. And um, seven years later, it came back to me. Seven years later, I haven't learned mine because, of course, for seven years, I've been diving into the scriptures and uh, I'm studying uh, uh, just rigorously. And the 1611 is put into my hands. And as soon as I as soon as that book is put into my hands, um, I knew that there was something hidden in it. I didn't know what it was, but I, there, I knew there was something special with this book. And I, I put it in the hands of another man, um, of a guy that I was working with. And he took a look at it and he said the same thing. As soon as he saw it, he knew there was something hidden in it. And and so uh, this is where the first two ciphers were unlocked, which took us to the location. And when we wow. found the location, we didn't know what we were looking at because we're just coming into this. And so we did a backfield. You start backtracking. OK, you know, who had the book in their hands? Who, who, you know, and then, of course, Francis Bacon comes in and, OK, who is this man? And then I find out that he's actually William Shakespeare. And so, OK, now I, and and it just snowballed to where we were able to take everything. It's, it's almost as if everybody's been gathering the evidence from the starting point, working towards the end point. And we were placed at the end working backwards. And now we have met in the middle and we're actually able to connect the two together to fully understand what Bacon did. That's really, really an interesting way to look at it. And, um, and I appreciate what you said in terms of, um, you know, starting at the end and with him working backwards. Um, you know, my friend and sometimes co-host uh, John Edwards and I, and I, I've mentioned this to you uh, just about every time we've talked. I, um, we've often talked about this and, and uh, Will Russell and, and uh, Jason Mercer as well. We, we've, been thinking that there is what we are referring to as a mega cipher that is interrelated between all of these documents that Bacon ever touched. And that that's exactly what you're describing. I, I think you really tapped into uh, an, an aspect or an element of that. So um, I'll tell you what, uh, do you want to go ahead and jump into your starting point here and I'll pull up your images and we can. Um, yeah. So, so we're, this actually is not the very beginning. So the very beginning of his work would be, of course, the sonnets. And you have several ciphers. And then, of course, the dedicatory of that sonnet tells you to go to, it says that there's a treasure map in Henry IV. And so if that's a true cipher, then we should be able to go to Henry IV and find a, a treasure map of some kind. Yeah. And if you can do that, then would that, that solidifies that cipher that is in the sonnets. And, and that's and it, really, you know, because if you have a cipher and you're leaving a cipher in in a book, but that cipher doesn't do anything, it has no purpose. Then what was the point of even leaving it? And correct. and and that's it also, what, it also calls into question whether you found anything at all. Absolutely, case. absolutely. Right. absolutely. Right. Uh, right. Francis Bacon actually makes it very clear that his ciphers are the cipher of a function. They actually perform a function. And yeah. so if if you've actually found a cipher and it's actually one of his ciphers, it will perform a function. It will unlock something for you to take the next step. Absolutely. And that was my experience as well, Ryan. And um, I, I've said this often on the show is that uh, when I began to work on decrypting uh, the plaque of the funerary monument of Shakespeare in Stratford-upon-Avon in Holy Trinity Church, 
it taught me how to unlock the rest of the ciphers. And yes. so th th this, this was his uh, uh, method of learning and teaching uh, was to uh, encrypt it in such a way that as it led you forward, you would learn how to continue to decrypt it and unlock more of the secrets. Yeah. It's almost as, as if he knew, out. it's almost as if he knew hundreds of years later, we would not be speaking that language. Ciphering right. would be basically gone. And so you would have to be taught. And so he does it with this mind of curiosity. Fortunately for me and you, it's not yeah. done with rather a mind of wisdom. Otherwise, you know, it may be too <laughs> difficult for us. Yeah. And so it's done with this mind of curiosity. Now, some of them are very, you know, very well done and you really have to be quite smart to, to get them. Other yeah. ones, other ones are very basic and it's just, you know, having an eye to see things that, that, don't, exactly. that, that don't, that aren't, you know, necessarily right in your face. Which brings us to our first real question before we jump in. Uh, uh, one of our regular viewers, Tom Burns, always asks a really great question. He says, when you say, as soon as I saw it, what was it specifically that you saw that told you there was something hidden there? I, th I think that's a great question, Tom. Thanks, bud. Absolutely. So when I opened it up, there's a there's a page before you get into the scriptures. It's called How to Find Easter Forever. Yes. And at the bottom... Wait, wait. At the bottom, there is a uh, it's like a it's like a uh, it's a design. And in the middle of that design is the head of what we refer to as bafflement. It's a it's a it's a uh, it's a goat head. Mm -hmm. And I just saw it immediately. And I'm thinking to myself, what is that doing in this book? Why in the world would you ever put something like that in this book? And that's when I realized that's when I realized, OK, there, there's something about this book. You know, you, you just don't do that for no reason. And that was the first that was that's what happened as soon as I put it in my hand and I opened it up. Thank you for that, because, I mean, that's one of the things that we, we talk about on the show all the time is when you see something that is out of place or, or appears to be some form of a mistake, it, that is always a signpost that tells you that there's something else at work there. Yes. Great observation. Great question, Tom. Thanks for that. All right, um, Ryan, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen here. I'm going to pull up your first image. Okay. Now, it's important to know, to get into the mind of Francis Bacon, Francis Bacon is claiming that he has the Ark of the Covenant, that this light of that this light of knowledge was passed on to him. You can see this on your funerary monument that you have on your cover, talking about the menorah and the Ark of the Covenant. We have several ciphers of him clearly saying he has the Ark of the Covenant and they hid it and they basically created a temple. And that is where this treasure map, that's where this map is leading you to. And you must find it. Wow. He he was a prophet. This if this man had the Ark of the Covenant. He had the father with him and he would have been a true prophet. And we're going to see as we as we break this map down that he's actually using the scriptures as to how to name it, where to put it, why he carved him, why he carved his tomb out in this in this mountain. All of this is in the scriptures. And so he's he's basically laying out the scriptures. And okay. hundreds of years later, we get to walk in it, making the scriptures come to pass. Amazing. So here, here's the first image. Uh, here is is there any anything in particular you want me to zoom in on to it, if so just say well so this, this is probably one that most people have seen peter amundsen uh shows us this this is how he gets his the beginning of where he gets his star map and what mm -hmm. you have is if you go up to that top corner you got the word uh butter when it should be bacon and call for <laughs> eggs and butter and that should be bacon and then when you follow the line down it takes you to the word bacon Got it. Does everyone see yeah. that? And then okay. he also he also found two star constellations, which is Boots and Wayne, which crossed, and you notice they both crossed the word I am. And there's I am. Now he looked at that and said, the I am in the heavens, Exodus 3.15. This is where the father gives us his name. I am or one of his titles. And so he's thinking we need to look upward, but that's not what this cipher is saying. And how this is done is there are actually sometimes when you come across the cipher, there are there's uh, there's more to it. You, you're, you've only unlocked one portion. You see what I'm saying? And so he unlocked right. it how he thought made sense. But the directions are actually just just on the opposite page. And if you go okay. down to the line 35, which reversed is 53, there's that marker number. It says, uh, just go up a little bit. It says, uh, and now I will unclasp a secret book. Keep going up. There you go. Oh, there it is. Now that's line 35. 
Now I will unclasp a secret book. And if you go down to line 40, it says on the unsteadfast footing of a spear. <laughs> so when you go back to that line with the I am in the center, we're unlocking a book. We're looking for a book. We're not looking for a star map. We're un he, he's, now he's unclasping a secret book. And it ends up being the 1611 King James Bible. Okay. So anything left here with these pages? Yeah, bro, these sin, right below it, send danger from east to west. So on across it from north to south, they would navigate using the stars. That's where you're getting the boots and Wayne. And he's telling you to cross it with the right. France, with the bacon. And that's so it's explaining how you got that circle with the X. Got it. And, we, and the whole purpose of this cipher is to un is to put a book in your hand. And that book holds the map, the, the cipher map. So the sonnets, when it said the treasure map in Henry IV, well, now we're in Henry IV, and Henry IV is putting a treasure map in your hands. Wow. And so on to the next image here. This is page 55, which is also another cipher uh, number for Francis Bacon. Correct. And when you look short cipher for the name Francis Bacon. Yep. And when you look, it says, I am sworn brothers to a leash of drawlers and can call them by their names as Tom, Dick and Francis. And that should be Harry. The word Harry is actually up further up on up on, on the column. And okay. so that's twice. Now you have eggs and butter and you have Tom, Dick and Francis. And so you just reverse them and you're getting the name Francis Bacon. It's a calling signature letting you know I've. I've, I've left this. Got it. Okay. On to the next. And here we are at the 1611. So uh, now we're, now we're, we're just following along, right? The, the ciphers perform a function. And so the sonnet said that you would find a map in Henry the fourth. We go to Henry the fourth and now he's put this secret book in our hand. It ends up being the 1611 Bible. So now we've opened up this page and this is the cover photo. And if you zoom in up at the top, you're going to notice a captain. He's dressed completely different than everybody else. And he's standing in what's referred to as a captain stance. Everybody else is wearing robes. He's pointing okay. down. His hand is pointing down. They use, there's many different ways in which Bacon uses a cipher, as you know, capital letter cipher. He also uses pictorial ciphers. Correct. And so here we have the man in, what you're saying is a captain's uniform? Yes, he's yeah. in a captain's uniform, and he's actually standing in what's referred to as a captain's stance. And he's holding a chalice? Yep. Or grail? And he's pointing downward here with this hand. Got it. And that finger is pointing down to a tribe, what's referred to as the tribe of Asher. Right there. Right, right here. Now that by itself, you know, you can't really do much with it, but we we're going to hold it because you clearly have a man pointing down at this symbol. I would agree with that. And there's other things going on with this drawing too. Oh you boy. see you see how uh do you see how how detailed that drawing is? Oh yeah, I mean and um William Russell and and uh Jason Mercer and I and, and uh uh John Edwards have, have actually, we have a, uh, an episode where we actually looked at and decrypted many of these images. Yeah. So right off to the left, you see Moses, uh, what's supposed to be Moses, and he's holding the tables of stone with nothing written on it. That right there should not be that way. It's so detailed. You go right down to the bottom and these people holding books have, have writings in the books. In the books. You can, you can yeah. see it on the page. And so... Why, why are you so detailed here? But here it's, it's completely bare. And then you'll notice he's wearing pants. One of his <laughs> legs are sticking out and he's wearing pants. And then next to him, you have that, what it should be a shepherd staff, which makes that circle, but this is a spear and it looks like it's shaking. It's a depiction yeah. of Shakespeare and he's letting you know, Shakespeare didn't write nothing. That's why there's nothing on the tables of stone. Oh, geez. I hadn't even thought of that. That's cool. When you look down at the corner, you see the other man with the book in his hand and he's holding the pen. This guy right here to your right. He's looking up at the guy, looking up at Moses. He's the true author. The one that's being depicted, the one holding the tables of stone didn't write anything. Wow. Very interesting, Ryan. That's cool. That's a great interpretation. And so this is the, we're still in the Bible now, we're on the next page, and um, this has been found, it, it cr of course creates a, with a capital letter cipher, it creates a compass and ruler. 
and it spells out the word spear. And if you remember when we were just looking at the on the uh, uh, and now I will unclasp a secret book on the unsteadfast footing of a spear. This okay, is what so he's talking about. This is what he's talking about. So we have the S here and the P here. Yep. And then it's supposed to go through the E. R. It does in the in the uh, in the Royal Edition. OK, because of the, the way they printed it in the commoner edition, it, it doesn't quite line up, but it actually does line up in the original. In the original. Interesting. And so you have the word spear in a compass and ruler, and that's the unsteadfast footing of a spear. It's unsteadfast because it's a cipher. You have to unlock it. And then uh, if you would actually go back to that one uh, sure. real quick. Because there's a, no, there's a whole other cipher going on here. And so now that you have your compass and ruler spelling out spear, and we know we have his uh, secret book, um, he does the same thing. In the folio, he uses the 345 triangle. It ends up being huge um, as far as where the location is hidden. But he uses the 345 triangle in ciphers in many different ways, and he's doing it here as well by counting the words to the degree. And so, of course, a three, four, five is 37, 53 and 90 and it never changes. And so if you were to just count 37 words up from the bottom, you would get the word two. And then if you counted 53 words from the top down, you get the word scion. And then if you go from the bottom up to the 90th word, you get the word sacred, giving you two sacred scion within the degrees of a three, four, five triangle. Wow. And that scion is a mountain. If you if you understand scripture, it's actually a movable mountain. And so it's a mountain prepared for a for a specific holy purpose. That's what Sion means. And and so this this he's he he's proclaiming that he's giving you directions to a mountain in which he's referring to as Sion. Wow. OK, um, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, usually at this point, I like to take a break quickly. This is really interesting stuff, Ryan. Uh, take a look at see if we have any questions. Um, let me stop screen share. Let me see. Um, so let's see. Um, and Daniel, again, you know, does point out, yes, pointing down is a Rosicrucian Masonic symbol. Yeah, 100%. It's always a signpost of, of pay attention here. Uh, AO, out of curiosity, did Francis Bacon say where or the location he retrieved the Ark of the Covenant from before he took it? Well, we do know that he had a drawing, several drawings of a man named John D. There's a picture of a grave, and on the grave stone, you have a what, what's a, a, the Rosicrucian symbol. And then you have John D on one side of the grave and you have bacon on the other side of the grave and he's passing what it's a, it's a lantern. What's lantern. referred to as the light of knowledge. That's the Ark of the covenant. And so we know that he retrieved it from John D. Now that opens up a whole nother, a whole nother deal because of who John D was and his connections. And, 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 and so, but it, from what I've been able to trace, I believe he retrieved it from John D. Interesting. They, again, interesting theory. Uh, Brain Sue says he's been watching you for a while. Um, yeah, I've had conversations with him. He's a good guy. Indeed. Uh, Tom Captain also looks to me like he is the only one not wearing a shirt or top under his cape. No, I, I agree, Tom. I noticed that as well. Yeah, we yes. actually have a cipher of uh, in the folio on how to read that uh, that cover photo. I do a video on it on my channel, and it breaks down the sleeve, everything. I mean, when when you when you go through the folio, the folio is not just the plays of Shakespeare. They actually give you directions on how to read his map, and so there's different angles in which you have to understand. You have to understand how to unlock the ciphers, then you have to understand how uh, how it correlates with the scriptures. And then you also have to uh, 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 be able to break that cipher down correctly, like, like like Jake was saying, because you can get thrown off real real easy. Yeah, yeah, it's very easy. So they have, fact, to, they, they have to perform that function, and that function has to lead you to the next step. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Kat wants to know, uh, where is Mount Sion? Could it be related to Mount Sinai? That uh, That's actually a question that's come up often, Kat. Good question. What do you, yes. what, what do you think, Ryan? 
So uh, Deuteronomy chapter four tells you what Sion is. Um, it's actually uh, referred to as another name for it would be Mount Nebo. And uh, they, where, where they got it mixed up in the scriptures is it's also, it says this is Sion, which is Hermon. And so they were they refer to it as Mount Hermon. But Mount's not in that verse, just Hermon. And Hermon in Hebrew means a set apart place for a designed holy purpose. And so uh, Sion is merely a set apart place for a divine holy purpose. It could be anywhere. It, it's really up to the father and it has to be revealed. And so it moves. It's a mountain in which moves. And basically when you're following it in scripture, wherever the Ark of the Covenant is, that's where Sion is. Did not know that. Uh, Carolyn, uh, one of our regular viewers is asking, what, what is your background, Ryan? I don't have any background as far as... Um, <laughs> ciphers or anything like that. Like I said, I was 30 years old and I heard, I heard a voice and I knew at that moment that I had a creator. And so I began searching for that voice. And of course you go into the church and I spent years in there and, and I finally realized that the voice isn't here. And so I went off independently and seven years later, I ended up finding his true name. And from that point, that's where the 1611 was put in my hand. And that's when the map began to get put in my hands. And, and now here we are. And so it's just been this process, but I don't have any background of any kind. But, but in, in, for you, and you and I have had this conversation multiple times and we, I, I think we can kind of get into this at the end after your, you, um, your, your decryption, but you're, you're obviously coming at this uh, from the perce uh, perspective of a, a man of faith. Obviously. Yes. I, my testimony is that the father spoke to me, or if it wasn't the father, something spoke to me, um, whether it was the father uh, literally or a messenger of some kind, I don't know, but, uh, but I heard a voice and I've spent years looking for that voice and I found that voice and that voice has put this into my hands. And he, the way it was explained to me is it's what's referred to as his marvelous work and a wonder. And he has, he, the father has orchestrated men over 2,600 years to get it in this final location for this time. And we're going to see how 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 Bacon clearly understands this. Um, so so we have a captain pointing down to the tribe of Asher and we're going to see that this location is named Asher. Well, why would he do that? And Genesis forty nine twenty, it's he's 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 fulfilling scripture by doing that. It says it's a prophecy for the end times. And it says out of Asher shall be fat and shall yield royal treasures. Wow. And so, and so that's, that's going to happen when we finish this and the ark rises in Asher. That's going to come to pass just in a way in which we could have never, never known and, until it's revealed to you. Wow. So Daniel is um, <clears throat> asking a question that occurred to me right when you said that Zion is something that moves. Uh, could the movable mountain refer to the invisible college on wheels? Daniel, I was thinking the same exact thing. Uh, the invisible college image, which is, uh, you know, very famous. We, we've done a um, yep. breakdown of that here on this show um, or vice versa. You know, is the invisible college. Um, well, that is, and wings, so that is that an image or a representation of Zion? It's all, well, it's, for one, it is telling you that it's, it's, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a miniature temple on wheels. Right. Right. And that, um, so, and so it's being, that temple's being moved which means it's, it's, it ends up being Scion. Scion is now moving. Got it. Uh, Zalo, um, our, and our friend Z, wants to know, uh, what is your YouTube channel? Uh, it's, it's Ryan Plaster. We can it's, it's, it's just a testimony. That, that's why it's named that. It's, it's, it's my testimony as to what the Father did with me and what he has shown me and how he has led us every step of the way to be where we are right now. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> so... Uh, our friend AO says, thank you guys. Th this is mind blowing information. Thanks AO. Uh, Adam Thomas is saying, I have a feeling you're going to take us towards Asher, Arkansas in a moment. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, pretty, I am. <laughs> good right there. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah. A lot of people asking what, what your YouTube channel is. They're, they're very interested. Um, now, uh, one reason why a lot of people have not heard of Scion is because when you open up a Bible today, you you will they replaced it they removed Sion with Zion and these are two completely different mountains and so that yeah. creates a huge problem when you open up the six when you open up a Bible today I think you'll find the word Sion four or five times when you open it up in the 1611 you'll find it over a hundred times and so that changes the whole ball game when you understand it's a completely different mountain 
And sure. the re and the whole reason why Francis Bacon even orchestrated the 1611 and put the, the map in that book is because Revelation chapter 10 says that a man's going to do that. So he understands it, obviously, and he believes that he's that man. And when he does it, that makes it happen. OK, so you, that, that you just brought me to my next question, because I was going to say now. Was Francis Bacon doing this to fulfill scripture or, or or was he imitating it to use the scripture as clues to lead people to where he wanted them to go? And what you're saying is that he believed himself to be that man who was yes. chosen to do this. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you 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 answered my question right there, because that, that's what I was gonna ask you. you uh, know, Jan Scorza says out of Asher, is that similar could it be out of ashes, maybe? Uh, no, it, it's a uh, yeah. It's Genesis forty nine twenty, and it's Jacob talking to his sons, the children of Israel, and he's about to die, and he's telling them what he's giving. He's giving each of his children a prophecy that's going to befall them at the end of days. And Asher is one of his children, and he tells him, "Out of Asher, you shall be fat, and you will yield royal treasures at the end of days." Now, the only question we have to ask is, how is that going to be done? Well, okay. now we're starting to understand a man named Francis Bacon obviously saw that, understood it. And, and when he applies it to this work 400 years later, when we're unlocking it, it's going to make that come to pass. This is such an interesting theory, uh, Ryan. I, like I said, you know, you and I have talked a lot on the phone uh, leading up to this. And um, again, you know, we, we come at this information from completely different angles. Uh, and yet... Um, a lot of the things that uh, you're doing with the 1611, a lot of things you're doing with the first folio, um, I see all that in there as well. And so, um, you know, th this is this is just a just an amazing, really interesting take. Hey, Jason, I'm glad you could make it. Um, all right. I'm going to take us back to your presentation. And great questions, gang, as usual. Such an amazing uh group of people here. So here we are. Um, and this was the uh, square and compass. Yeah. So we have um, we, the uh, sphere. Yeah. We got the captain pointing down to Asher. And now we have this in a three, four, five triangle saying two sacred scion. And so we're going to hold those two. Now, this is the next page of the dedicatory. And if you'll focus on the three dots at the very bottom, it's in a parentheses right there yep that's what's um some people uh correlate that to what's referred to as the three-point brothers um they say that that goes all the way back to i believe 1774 but obviously it goes back much further than that because we're yeah. seeing it here in the 1611 um they have they have actually found this symbol on medallions um it represents and, and in and in uh um documents uh freemasonry documents i guess they would use these in between initials and yep. so my initials are RLP. You would have that uh, that symbol after the R, that symbol after the L, and that symbol after the P. And so what he's trying to convey to you here is you're looking for three letters. And when you go up, you see the the P, the A, and the M forming a triangle. Map. Yep. Now it says Pam. But we actually have the directions on how to read this cipher to know that we're at, to know that we're unlocking it correctly. And so and where, where did you find these directions? I in, mean, the, that, in the first folio, in the dedicatory of the first folio. Gotcha. OK. And, and, and so, you mentioned that earlier. Yeah, it'll be the next one. And we'll just flip back and forth so you can see it. So this is the dedicatory of the first folio. And this falls on line 20, which, of course, is RC. And it says, upon the muse's anvil, turn the same and himself with it that he thinks to frame. And so if we go back now to the other image. Just zoom into the triangle. Upon the muse's anvil and on that A, you have the word anvil. So upon the muse's anvil, upon Bacon's anvil, we're going to turn this. And when you turn it, the shape doesn't change. It's the same, right? Right. But the letters would. So you no longer have Pam, but now you have map. 
So upon the muse's anvil, turn the same and himself with it that he thinks to frame. We're framing, okay, you we're onto your ciphers and you're, you're wanting us to go to a map. And then you look up at the top and it says, and give liking unto nothing but what is framed. And so we know that he's giving you directions on how to read this. And what he wants you to do is he wants you to go to the map in the 1611 Bible. And you're going to look at the section that has the frame around it. Yes, in the 1611, um, in the top left-hand corner, the, the map for Jerusalem is actually framed in, and that ends up being our aerial view map. And so he wants you to only focus on that because when you're at that location, you clearly see it, and that's, 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 that's where everything's happening. Uh, I agree, and that, that's the part that I decrypted as well. So uh, there's more here, I, I imagine. Yeah, there, yeah, those are actually several different ciphers, um, not pertaining to what we're talking about tonight. Okay. But uh, yes, there are many ciphers there. So now we're we've we've we're, we're to, we have the captain pointing down to Asher. We have the two sacred scion. Now we're being told to go to the map in the in the uh, 1611. So we're at the map and we're looking for something. And what it ends up being is this compass right here. You'll notice this compass south is in the wrong position. You have east on the right. So west should be where his where his little arrow is, but it's south. And so we already have a problem with the compass. And then when you zoom that compass in, that compass is actually a clock. It's a clock and a compass. And that's what's referred to as a compass rose. And compass rose is the first uh, it's the first uh, invention in which they were able to actually give you an actual latitude longitude coordinates. Correct. And so um, this is very interesting. OK, so how, how would we read this? And of course, you would take your fixed numbers and you would and you would write those fixed numbers down and then you'll take south and you'll turn it into the correct position, which means your dial hands will turn. You see what I'm saying? And when you add it up, it ends up being the three, four, five triangle. It ends up being 37 degrees north by 90 degrees west. And when you type that in, you'll land on a town called Asher, Arkansas. Now, Asher, Arkansas's coordinates are actually 30. It's like 35.9, oh, right at 36 degrees. And then the, the longitude is, I believe, right at 93 degrees. And so they were one degree off on the longitude and they were a couple of degrees off on the on or on the latitude and, a, and two or three degrees off on the longitude. They, 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 they weren't off on the longitude. Right. And, and, and I heard they, you explain they, that. So that makes yeah. more sense to me now. Right. Um, and people watching right now, uh, what I'm referring to is that um, uh, Bacon and company were always measuring from the Paris Meridian, uh, which was two degrees, uh, 20 minutes, 14 seconds uh, to the east of the current uh, prime meridian. Yes. Yeah, so that. So so that would mean 400 years ago, he was only one degree off on each spot. And that's just pretty amazing to me. It is. It is. And so and so here you have him pointing down to a tribe called Asher. And now through a compass that are in a map that you've led us to in which we clearly have an error. South is in the wrong position. You know, they, you, you just don't make those mistakes. And right. off of that fixed compass, we have got a latitude longitude coordinates, which takes us to an actual location in which the name of that place is called Asher. What's the odds of that? Yep. I mean, it's just, it really is mind boggling. It's, it, it takes a while to wrap your mind around that. Is that possible? Um, well, as he says, you know, if you want to know if something's true, test it out. And right. so we've done that. And what we have found is just nothing short of amazing where he, as you're going to see, he, um, he makes it very clear. This is the location. Right. And so here on the image, um, we're looking at Asher on the map, right? So this would be Asher in the 1611 map. And if you look off just to the right of it, you got this little river system. Okay. Now, when you pull up in Asher, on a GPS, it has a river that runs through it, and it looks just like that. Just like it. Now, up from the fork, you'll notice on that fork, just up from the fork on the right, you have this dot with the word Miera. And Miera means cave. It's Hebrew for the word cave. It's used one time in Scripture, uh, Joshua 13.4. And when you go to it in the 1611, he even has it off to the side or the cave. 
And so he lists it in the map as Miera River, but Miera is not a river at all. It's a cave. And when you go to that spot, if when you go to the to the fork of the river in Asher and you walk down the rock shelf, you find a cave. Okay. I, it, 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 the best part is, uh, Ryan, when we get to the end of this, I, you, you've never walked me step by step through this before. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, I, I got to say, I'm kind of um, impressed here. I, I'm going to do something here. We don't need to show all my locations here. I'm going to, but let's look at Asher, Arkansas. Are you seeing this on your screen? I am. All right. So we're going to go to Asher, Arkansas, everyone, here on Google Earth, real time. Oops. All right. Uh, be our guide here, uh, Ryan. Where, where are we finding this uh, river? Okay, so you'll have to zoom in further for me. It's okay. gonna it looks like it's gonna be right off to your right. Okay. So go to your right. There it is, right, right there. So this is the river system here. Nope. Uh, so zoom in for me, and as you zoom in, you're gonna see it. Okay, you're gonna want to come back, come back down. There it is right there. See it? There's okay. your riverbed. So this riverbed, you said, um, matches up with the shape. Yeah, you follow the river down and it will split off. And one side goes for a ways and then stops. And then the other side's kind of short and stops, just like the drawing. Right here? Yep. One side splits off this direction, and one side keeps going this direction. And let's just turn it a little bit. It may go for a little ways further. I'm not 100% sure. Because you'll clearly see it split off. Right, right. Yeah, I just wanted to see how closely it matched up. So. It's better to see at certain times. It looks like that time it's empty because it's actually, it's actually a creek is what it is. Right. And so at certain times of the year, it's dried up and you're only seeing the riverbed. Right. And then also during the summer, it looked like that was definitely a summer photo because of all the trees in the sure. Ozark in the Ozark Mountains. Man, once once you get the it's very difficult to see it from a satellite position. Oh, sure. All right. Cool. So what are we looking at here? So this is the this is if you were to go there and if you were to go at that fork and to go up to the right side, just as that drawing showed, it's according to this drawing, you're going to find a cave at, at this somewhere at this at this dot. And when we got there, that's that's what you found. It is in the shape of a keystone and it has the letter G on the entrance. It's not carved on there. It's almost like they use some sort of a chemical to make that bleed out through the rock. Is, it, is this the G you're referring to? Really? Yes. Yep. Hmm. And we know through drawings, there's many Freemasonry drawings in which you have the keystone with the circle in it. And when you pull that back, that's exactly what that's exactly what it is. It's a keystone and you have the circle in the center. We were looking for a cave. That's what we were looking for. Right. And <clears throat> in the ciphertext I decrypted, uh, once uh, he also referenced uh, a hidden keystone. Yep. So, yeah. And th th this is that keystone. This is what it looked like. So this is what it looks like after we excavated and, and did all the digging. And so you dug out all of this. Yes, that goes down 10 feet. 
And didn't you say a lot of this stone, it seemed as if it was um, like concrete, like, like concrete. concrete. If you, you can actually see it, look at all the rock around it. And then you see the coloration of the rock up here. And then you see the floor of the cave. It's completely different. Wow. That's really interesting. It's almost like it's almost like they made concrete. Which right. it's you know the whole mountain's made out of limestone, and so it's you know that that, that would be that would make total sense. Sure. And, and this is true. this is just a few feet from the cave, and it's on a stone, and it's of of course uh, a carving of an eyeball. Definitely looks man-made. Oh yeah, when you when you when you're looking at it, you clearly clearly an eye. This is the G again on the keystone. This is what was inside. So when we started excavating, we didn't get in very far. We went in probably probably three or four feet into the keystone. And on the left-hand side, we pulled out human leg bones. There was no, no, no ribs, no head, no arms. It was two hips, two upper legs, two lower legs, and two kneecaps. And that is what that's the only thing that we pulled out. And then there were three wood, wood, hand carved wood planks and hand carved wood beams running vertical and horizontal above the bones. And then in the very back, when we excavated, got to the very back of the cave at the very bottom, we found a shovel head. Which is that one right there. No. And they would, they would have taken a handle that that gap that you see it's not nearly as big as it looks like in your in the picture and they would have taken a, a you know a piece of wood that was split and they would have ran it up in there and tied it off and then that would have been your shovel and when your handle broke you just put a new one on right so now I'm assuming you had a lot of these materials tested or or, or someone did did, well, did, I, did you did you have any help of um, archaeologists when you're pulling this stuff out no, I, I'm looking at that just with with common sense saying, uh, you know, that's a shovel. And of course, I know they would have had to have dug to get this done. And so it, it just makes total sense when you're done. Right. Throw throw something in there with your bones to kind of, you know, another piece of evidence, physical evidence. It's not an right. easy thing to get somebody to believe something that hasn't yet appeared. And so and this is according to Bacon. And so he understood very much that, you know, to get these people to follow this cipher map. And when they finally get to this location, you're going to need to give them something that can grip them, something that something that they know. OK, this is real. This is what you have told me I would find. Now, you you've shared with me the significance of it, of there only being leg bones. Right. Um, so can you kind of take us through that of, of why that was so significant? Why only just leg bones? So um, he actually tells you that in, in one, of, uh, one of the pictures we got. Um, it should be coming up. It's the epilogue. Epilogue? Yeah. Was it um, this one? This was the next one. You no, had. no. Just keep going. Okay. Right here. So if you zoom this in, this is in the first folio. And this um, it falls on page. So you have a misnumbering and what mm -hmm. it is, it, it goes from like 100 to 69. I can't I can't remember the number. But when you do the mathematics on it with just simple addition or subtraction, it's the number 33. And so right. and so there's his signature. And so he wants uh, when you start reading this now, if, if you don't have the map and you're not at the location, then this isn't going to make any sense to you. But if you are at the location then this is going to make a whole lot more sense to you. And so when you start reading this, he's he's telling you, uh, be it known to you and it's very well that I was lately here at the end of a displeasing play to pray your patience for it and to promise you a better. A displeasing play is a play that's unfinished. And so an unfinished, even a play that's that where you have bad actors, you wouldn't necessarily call it unpleasing because they did, you know, they did put a lot of work into it. They may not have been the best actors, but they put work into it. And, and that's for a displeasing play would be something that started, but hasn't been finished. Okay. And so I think that's what he's, what he's conveying to you is that this is a play in which you guys are going to have to finish. We've set the stage. You're going to finish it. And he says, I did mean indeed to pay you with this, which if like in an ill venture, it come unluckily home, I break.
and you, my gentle creditors, lose. So what he's saying is this is a if, if, if this is an adventure. And if it, and if it comes unlike if they get caught, if it for any reason this happens, it doesn't go the way we need it to go. Everything we've done is for nothing. And you, the gentle creditors, you're going to lose your, because it's going to be taken from you. He says, here I promised you I would be, and here I commit my body to your mercies. Now, off to the left, there's actually a dot, and that same dot is in our map on the 1611. There it is. See it? You'll actually find that dot in the aerial view map of the 1611. It's to let you know, here I promised you I would be, and here I commit my body to your mercies. He left his body there. And that's what this is all about. Now we're finding out that he actually split it into two locations and he did that for a purpose. And so if we keep reading here, it says here, I promised you I would be and here I commit my body to your mercies. Beat me some and I will pay you some. And as most debtors do promise you infinitely, if my tongue cannot entreat you to equip me, will you command me to use my legs? And yet that were but light payment to dance out of your debt. It's talking to you. He's telling you what you're going to find when you get there. And we're going to we're going to actually look at another cipher where he's actually telling you, I left my legs. I want you to understand. Think about it. Why would I do that? He actually gives us a cipher where he's asking us to think about why I left my legs there. And that comes up later in this series. Yes. Oh, cool. And there's a lot more going on, you know. There's, there's just so much. We can't really impact it in two hours. So, yeah, that's for sure. So, looking at, we left off with the... The shovel head. Shovel head. And I, I kind of got you out of sequence there. Sorry, that's okay. Um, so, what are we looking at here? So, what, what we have now is, so now we've unlocked all the way to where we're at the location, right? And we've found the keystone. We found the G. We got the leg bones. We got the shovel. We got the eye. What do we What do we have here? When you're standing out there, what you're going to see is that map in the corner of Jerusalem is actually an aerial view map of the location of Asher. They match identically. And you have John Speed's signature on that map. He was the first aerial view map maker. And so I actually have John Speed in ciphers, too. He was part of the work, and he's the one who institutes this aerial view map into this Jerusalem map. And so how do we unlock it? That's what this is right here. So this is in the 1611 dedicatory page and it talks, it gives you several verses. And one of the verses, it says to go to John 539. And when you go to John 539 up at the top letterhead, it says, as of the resurrection, search the scriptures. And so if we were to do that, what resurrection story would we be going to? Well, most would think of course, the resurrection of Yahushua, correct? But it's actually ends up being the resurrection of Lazarus. And so if you'll go to the next picture, we'll see uh, the story of Lazarus, Lazarus and John. This is this ends up being John chapter 10. And if you'll look at verse 15, it says, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent you may believe. And you have that smiley face. You see that? Mm -hmm. That should not be there. <laughs> That, 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 that's not, that's not a, uh, that's not any kind of a punctuation. And so that, 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 that's a, that's kind of a way of like a signpost, like, Hey, pay attention because we're of course dissecting the resurrection story. We were sent here by him. And so then I go down to verse 18 and it says, now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem about 15 furlongs off and you have another smiley face. And then off to the side, a furlong that is about two miles. So 15 furlongs is about two miles. And you have that smiley face to the intent you may believe. And it's then 9,900 feet because a furlong is 660 feet for those yep. of you doing the math out there. And of course, the, so the two smiley faces and then 18 plus 15, your two verses being used gives you the number 33. 33. That's your signpost for bacon. And so now that he's given us this measurement, uh, uh, this about two mile measurement. What do we do with that? Well, he's giving you this measurement to apply it to the cipher map. And so when you go to the cipher map and you apply that, that measurement to your map, it actually, it actually gives you the location of where his upper half is. The lower half was just given to us when we found the keystone, 
the upper half you have to find, and that's what the aerial view map is for. Okay. And, um, you know, people who watch this show uh, are going to recognize that um, this version of the um, 1611 King James uh, is not the same typeface as the original, as the facsimile. This is um, a modernized font that's easier to read. Yes. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, John, Will, and, and Jason and I discovered was that much of the alignments, much of the punctuation that you find in this version is exactly the same. As yes. The so I, I want to point that out for people who are saying are, are going to look. And, and that's say, oh, that's what? also that's also why the compass and ruler didn't line up like I was saying because yeah. it's not the actual. The actual original it does line up. It lines up, and um, and I, I find that's the case in a lot of these, uh, uh, particularly the uh, uh, ge geometrical ciphers. Uh, they don't exactly line up, but. Uh, they certainly do in the original. This is this is interesting stuff. All right. So this is in your map. This is the bottom corner. If we're going to apply it to, right, we have to apply this measurement to our map. Well, it just so happens we have a scale of miles here. And so we were given about two miles. So I just took it from the very start over to the second mark, and I applied it to the aerial view map. And this is what you get. Jerusalem being the cave, the center point, the keystone. And you go out about that measurement, and this is your radius you get. And you'll notice down at the bottom, it's hitting that symbol. It's a Y with a T on top of it. That symbol is in your monuments. Mm -hmm. um, it's a whole other cipher. All the ciphering that you guys have broken on that monument, there's actually another cipher on there, which is unlocking how to locate his body in the aerial view map. And it's done with symbols, a Y with a T, a Y with an S. You'll notice in the when you're looking at the aerial view map off to the side in the, in the, uh, in the ledger there, where it's giving you the A to Z and the 1 through 14. Uh, of course, the number 1, 2, and 5 are missing. Correct. But uh, the number 5 is actually in the map. It's just not listed. Right. The number S is listed, but it's not in the map. And, there's, right. and so there's this switching. And then, of course, E. E is the fifth letter of the alphabet. The Y and the E. That's in the in the uh, in that monument. All this is all these are symbols to apply to this map. And and how, how do you apply them? I guess I'd ask. Okay, so uh, so if you were to go up to um, the corner where you have the the uh, it looks like a grave. Oh, we're, we, we're getting there here coming up. Okay, I just anticipated. Okay, well, we'll, we'll just wait for that then, uh, Ryan. You can explain it then. Yeah, I just wanted to show you this is what you this is where you're getting that measurement from. Okay. And with that measurement, because it's an aerial view map, and if you'll look up at the top, you'll see Jerusalem, and then underneath it, you have the word cave. And it's highlighted here. I'm going to zoom yep. in. And there it is, gang. C-A-V-E. Because this is an aerial view map of a cave. That's actually what it is. Wow. Okay. And then there's that dot. Remember what it said. Here I promised you I would be, and here I commit my body to your mercies. And you have that dot right there. Right there. Now look under the D. You have a Y under the D. Right. And if you were to move that Y to where that dot is, now you got the Y with the E above it which is in your monument. Understand? Yeah. And so you're, this is just the beginning phase. Now, then the next step is to take what's over in the corner, which is the, the number five, which is not supposed to be there because it's not listed in, in the ledger, but it's in the map. And what you're doing is you're going to converge them all down here to this symbol with the Y and the T above it. Okay. There's a lot going on with this map. Um, you have uh, you have the word map coded in it. When you flip the map upside down, you'll see the word map. We actually we actually, we also have pictorial ciphers in this map: a pig face, mm -hmm. um, a snake, um, a man wearing a a, uh, a head garment, and so and so. There's a lot going on with this map, and we're just yeah. we're we're slowly having to squeeze it in. And there's that symbol, if you'll zoom it in, the Y with the T on top of it. See that? 
You got the Y, and then just above it, it looks like a little pickaxe, but it's or a T, and it's in that okay. black. Yep, there it is. And then you'll also just yeah. above that, you have another box. Yeah, on um, the funerary monument plaque. Yes. If you freeze up. Anything? Is there anything else there, Ryan? Sorry about that. We were froze up there for a second. Oh, okay. Is there anything else after that? No, I think we're good there. But that that's that's where we believe his body is. We cannot get there right now. There's too much water. Um, we found a cipher where he said he has found a way to keep water out for a great while. And so um, everything that I have, I believe that that is where his body is. And we're going to look at one more cipher in the folio, which kind of... Uh, um, let you know that, 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 that's what your purpose is. That's what you're looking for. And so this summer we're going to try to dig that up. Well, we are going to dig that up as soon as we can get the equipment down there. Um, but we, in the meantime, we've actually found some, uh, new things that I haven't been able to tell anybody because we're testing them out right now, but they're huge and I've shown them to you. And I think you can testify. Yeah. It's, it's massive. Yeah, it is. And you know, when I'm, Going scrolling back, I'm looking at, um, you know, looking at some of the comments. <clears throat> so here we go. Um, Jan, wonder if the person who named Asher, Arkansas, had knowledge of this. Now, didn't you, you and I had this conversation because that was one of the first questions I asked you. I said, well, how far back does the name Asher actually go? Because what I've discovered in my work, a lot of times I'll be researching this stuff. And next thing you know, uh, I'll say I'll hit on a name. And then suddenly it's like, well, that was not the name of this place until the 1800s. Mm -hmm. so, so what was your experience with that? So we've been able to backtrack it. Arkansas becomes a state, I believe, in 1836. The earliest map that I can find is 1840, and Asher is on that map. Um, I ask myself the same question. Of course, I, I look at it completely different because I'm coming at it from the father perspective. I know that I was brought here through, through the father. and so. But I ask myself the question, if, if, if the map is in 1611, and we ain't even a country until 1776, and it's not even a state until Arkansas is not even a state until 1836. How did you know that it would be named Asher at that time? Because without that lining up, if I don't pull up GPS and see Asher and correlate it with the captain pointing down, I never go to the location. Everything right. hinged on it. And so how did he know? And so it's one of two things. Either the father told him that that is what was going to take place, and so he didn't have to worry about it, or – he, I, I, I know enough to know that you could not get this done without the Indians. The Indians would have had to help you do this. And we know that they had communication with them. They knew the language, I believe, all the way going back into the 1300s. And so there was already this relationship built. If the Indians were to help them and then they just kept that name all the way up until we become a state. And then when we start making towns, you just keep it what it is that you know that 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 would make sense but how did bacon know that that's how it was going to go down because the whole map hinges on it and um, that's really what that's really the one thing that hangs me up is it must be divine i you know and one of the things that um again either you know your explanation is correct uh, another possible interpretation and this this goes along with uh, daniel uh, spino's qu earlier question uh, about um scion versus the invisible college you know it's it's a chicken and egg question here uh which one represents which or do they just represent each other what how is this being used um you know that that's really the question and i, I really like uh your explanation of this idea that it could easily have been a name passed down uh, uh via the natives and yes. um one of the things that i've discovered in, in my work is that all of the colonies and place names that 
both Bacon and as well as uh, his, his his partner, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh. Um, and and these these guys were you know the Rosie Cross, uh, they uh, those two and Anthony Bacon uh, in my research. Um, what they would do is they would use names that uh, have that have cipher signatures when you calculate their values that equal the name of the person who founded it. For example, uh, uh, Francis Bacon renamed uh, uh, Arcadia Acadia as Samuel de Champlain, and all of those values point to Francis Bacon. Uh, Walter Raleigh founded the co Lost Colony of Roanoke, um, which, by the way, I just decrypted a, a message to everyone, and I now found out what happened at the Lost Colony of Roanoke. I was going to um, ask you because I've I've always yeah. wondered if they're if they're part of this. I mean, it's awfully strange that you just go disappearing, and we have this work that we know is is here. I right. Mean, if you, I mean, it's 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 very possible that that could be the case. It, it could be, but um, you know, the cipher message I found actually tells where uh, actually Sir Walter Raleigh did actually move them. Um, in secret, uh, there were hostilities with uh, the uh, Croatoas, Croatoas uh, uh, natives, um, and so the question is: you know, was Bacon fulfilling scripture? Was he using it as a roadmap to think that that's what he was doing? Um, well, you we, know, and so you know, we we have this this question, you know, that that. So you have the, like the first you, one. Was you come at it as, as you know, a true person of faith, which I greatly respect. And um, and so that interpretation of him, you know, makes sense. And on the flip side, if you think that he is actually utilizing it um, as a plan. Um, yeah, there's no doubt. Um, so there, there's, it, it could go either way. And um, so for Jan's question, what I did was um, I just and I remember I, I told you this last time we talked on the phone, Ryan, when I looked at the name of Asher if I were to see it as a context that this was a Rosicrucian creation and that they maintained, as you suggest, um, the name place, you know, via the natives in the area. And if Bacon and company were behind it and they planted this name uh, so that eventually the place name would, would stay, uh, that makes sense. And, but the name Asher itself actually calculates uh, to three different ciphers uh, for Walter Raleigh. And so, you know, it, it, it's interesting because that would mean that he was the one who, you know, founded it. Um, so, you know, good question, Jan. And, you know, I know, it's those... I know that the Indians at that time period, um, we call them today Quapaw, the Quapaw tribe. Mm -hmm. um, but at that time period, I guess their name was referred to as the Arcadians, which refers to as the Arc Carriers. Right. And I find that, I mean, you know, the, you, these are just more pieces coming together as to, you know, they were obviously part of it. Yeah. I mean, when and you, Indians when didn't you, value gold. They didn't value silver. They didn't value those things. And, and so right. it would have, it would have been a perfect partnership. Sure. Cat uh, wants to know if you went into the cave. Oh, well, absolutely. We excavated the whole thing. It's about, it, it's about 20, I'd say 20 to 25 feet deep. It it um it opens up into a circle into like a the top uh, into like a cathedral, and then there's holes in the back where they would have kept. They were in a line, straight line, and so they would have put their torches and stuff while they were chiseling this out. And it's a tomb. That's what it is. It's a tomb. It's what's referred to as RC's tomb. And this is actually he's replicating scripture. The reason why Bacon did it this way is it's is he's replicating Isaiah chapter twenty two. And this is where the father is asking who this man is that's created himself a grave on high and has made himself a habitation in a rock. And the, Bacon truly believes he's fulfilling scripture. He places it in the Ozark Mountains because of Zechariah 14, chapter 4 and 5. That actually gives a description of at the end of days, according to the father, he's going to be looking in the Ozark Mountains. That's why Bacon put it there. He understood on a level in which I'm under just now understanding, but in which most people it's been, it's been sealed from us. We, we, it, the father has prevented us from being able to see it until now. Okay. So, and again, for people listening, um, I want to be clear, you know, it doesn't say specifically in that chapter and verse, it doesn't name the Ozark mountains, but the way you've interpreted it. Well, so it's being what the yeah, what it says is that he's going to be in the in this time he's going to be standing on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Mm 
which is in the east. And so we know exactly where that location is. And it okay. says that he's going to be cleaving to this mountain. So he's fixed there. And it says that he's going to look west. And lo, there's going to be a very great valley. Okay, so if you were to do that, take a map, stand on the Mount of Olives and look west. Follow that line. You will not find a very great valley until you hit the United States. It sits between the Appalachian Mountains and the Rocky Mountains. It's the biggest valley in the world. That would constitute as a very great valley. And he's saying, he says within this very great valley, there's going to be a mountain range in which part of the mountain moved north and the other part of the mountain moved south, which means you have a river valley flowing east to west. There's only one mountain range that does that inside this very great valley, and it's the Ozark Mountains. Wow. Interesting interpretation. This is very, really, really interesting stuff. Uh, Jan wants to know, is there any idea how old this cave is and who could have made it? Well, so, for sure, Bacon did. They carved it out in the shape of a keystone. Um, they put the legs in there. Bacon's proclaiming that it's his legs. You have the G, which is the sign of their profession. Um, you have the all seeing eye, which is another, um, uh, they actually, that all seeing eye is actually twofold. Um, one, of course, it's saying, look into the cave, which you're about to come across, but it's also being used for, um, uh, uh, another play. When you're looking for the upper half, he's using a book by Christopher Marlowe and it's called, the book's called Hero and Lender. And you're basically following this story. He, uh, uh, Bacon seems to have a, a lot of respect for this man named Christopher Marlowe. I, I don't I haven't really gotten into the details as to why that is. I just know that he's using this story. And so that's really all I can really say about that right now. That That is actually a pretty interesting take, uh, considering the fact that um, uh, in my next book, I'm going to reveal the connection between Bacon and Marlowe uh, and, and the others. Um, yeah, I believe there is a connection there. Marlowe is an alias for one of the Rosie Cross. Yeah. Um, so. Um. And, and my answer to you, Jan, is, and I know that this is, you know, where this question's coming from. Um, people are going to ask Ryan, you know, isn't it just as likely or just as possible that this entire site, you know, with the G, uh, with the all seeing eye, both emblems of, of uh, Freemasons, um, and in that area, you have the offshoot, um, you know, uh, post Civil War of the Knights of the Golden Circle. Um, mm -hmm. is, is it possible that, you know, that was a KGC site, uh, that you've come Well, about? if we, if we just, if we had just walked upon the site and just happened to be at this location and just happened to run across this, then that might be possible, but that's not what we've done here. What we've done here is we've methodically unlocked ciphers, which brought you to a specific location. And when you get to that specific location, exactly what you find is exactly what these men proclaim you will find. They're Freemasons, so you're going to find their G. You're going to find their keystone. You're going to find what they're calling R.C.'s tomb. That's this whole purpose of this treasure map, to find R.C.'s tomb. Now we found the R.C.'s tomb, but we're finding only half of his body. So now we have to answer the question is, why did you only present us with half of your body? And so that's what we're unlocking now. There's just no way you can put all that together and it not be a Francis Bacon. Right. And so Amy Mollican wants to know, DNA kit done. <laughs> Did you have the bones analyzed by, you know, some professionals that. We took them to the yeah. university. Of course, when I find human leg bones, even though I have a cipher, um, I, at that time, I didn't have that cipher, but we believe we're following a map. And so we believe this belongs to whoever left this map. After doing uh, more research, I know that those are the bones of Francis Bacon, but. When you find human leg bones, you have them looked at because you don't know. That could be somebody's son. That could be somebody's daughter. And so we take them to the police department and the police department acted like they didn't even care. And so we, <laughs> I, I mean, gonna, it's true. I was I was all these that is to believe it's true. And so yeah, we, take, go ahead. we take, we take them to the university of Arkansas and have them look at them. And we brought the shovel head and we brought a piece of wood and we brought the bones and, um, he looked at them. They didn't have a, uh, a carbon dating testing kit. They said you'd have to send that off to Florida. And I believe at that time period, it was like almost a thousand dollars to have that done. Oh, wow. And uh, but what they did say was just based off looking at it, there was a curve in the in the in the upper leg bone. And they said that curve came from a massive leg muscle. They said whoever this man was, he was he was uh, over six foot tall and he had a massive leg muscle. And of course, trucking up and down the Ozark Mountains. 
four or five hundred years. They said that those bones were at least a couple hundred years old. So it wasn't constituted as a crime scene, which means I was allowed to keep them. And it's referred to as an archaeological dig. So the only thing that they could tell me is they're at least hundreds of years old. And so wow. that was good enough for me. At least I know it's not a crime and it fits with what I know. This man's bones. He says he left them and here they are. Yeah. You know, cause I mean, that was one of the things that we mentioned too. I said, well, you know, uh, how do, how do you remove, you know, human remains without, you know, contacting someone. Right. And you, you were like, no, the first thing you do is you, you have to report it. Um, yes. yeah. Uh, Jan, uh, an, again, you know, cause we, uh, did you have to get permission to dig there and who gave you the permission? Was it the owner? Go ahead. Well, that, that's, that's what, um, took, that's what's taken so long, uh, for a long period of time, we were actually doing it in secret. We would go, it's not, it's, it's not on the, uh, a man technically owns that land, but with Arkansas state laws, we have the right to be on it because it's so close to a Creek. And so even though it's owned by a, a private owner, you can be on that. Now it's against the law in Arkansas to dig anywhere. But when the father's put a map in your hands and you truly believe that you're doing his work, you know, who do I listen to? Do I listen to man or do I listen to my creator? And so we made the determination to listen to our creator and we were doing it in secret for a long time. Um, it seems like as the work's gone on, more and more people are showing up, which I expected whenever you declare this, you, you, you eventually are going to get um, people's attention, which is what we're wanting anyway. Um, right. But eventually I did. Eventually we did run across the owner of the property. And I have met him and now I do have permission and he's on board with what we're doing. And so it's uh, it's turning out in our favor. OK, good. And I, I'm glad that turned out because a lot of times, you know, uh, the people who enforce man's laws don't necessarily listen to uh, that particular argument. So, oh, I was really sweating it when I met him because I told him, you know, I said, if you if you tell me not to come back here, you know, I, I have to be honorable to that and I and I won't come back. And I'm, I'm praying to the father in this moment, you know, I'm just begging the father, please don't, don't tell him, no, don't come back. And then it just, I just heard the words come out of his mouth. You know, you guys are welcome to continue. And I just, that was it for me. Oh, wow. Good for you. Um, Tom Burns says, somebody else asked this same question. If Francis Bacon was deceased, who did he have carry out this work for him? And, and, you know, and well, when? So I believe the work was already done by the time he dies. They, he's he's there in Arkansas and they're staying there. And so the work is completely finished. And now he's just waiting to die. Now, when he when a man dies and that especially where they were in the wilderness, you would have been around the Indians. And how did Indians bury? They would actually build platforms and trees and they would put your body up in a tree and let you decompose until you are nothing but bones. And then when you're nothing but bones, they would bring your bones down and they would bury you in what's called an Indian burial ground in which everybody's buried together. You really don't have separate graves, but you just have burial, massive burial sites. Right. I believe that's a bacon. They follow ba bacon's wishes. He obviously somebody who trusts who he trusted immensely. And when he died, they put part of his bones inside that cave with and with the other uh the the shovel head and then they put his upper half wherever he told them to where wherever's marked in that map wow um you know and it's interesting because it, all of the um all of the work that i've done indicates that uh when bacon uh was working here in the colonies uh he, he made special efforts to reach out to the natives of, of every area he went into and befriend them um, he, he definitely did not want uh, any kind of antagonistic relationship with the na uh, native peoples yeah. here. So, and he um, gives he gives warnings. Yeah. Um, uh, I know this one that me and you went over. You know, uh, it's a warning uh, when you find the entrance. You know, if you see any, if you if you look at human indifferences, leave because we do not know them here. He did not look at, at at races or anything. Everybody was on an even playing field. And if you're with the father, no respect of persons. That's exactly what you would expect to see. Yeah. Uh, Dave Patel is watching. He sees a pig face in the symbol above the cave as well. Or a pig yes. Face symbol. Yes, there is a pig face there, which, of course, represents bacon. And then when you flip it upside down, you're going to see a knight. Uh, he's wearing a knight's helmet. And then you're going to see he's clutching a snake. Wow. 
All right. So that hasn't uh, been shown on my channel. So anybody who watches my channel is not going to know about that either. Uh, I did want to show a couple of new things. Um, we have the Omega symbol. We're going to kind of talk about a little bit. Um, yeah. That's another thing that we that that nobody knows about. And and there's just a, what what you're being shown tonight is really is just a small, small, small portion of what we have. We have so much evidence, immense, just in your face evidence that, you know, yeah. it, it, it's more than enough to know that this is real. This 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 is what bacon really has done. And this is where it's all this is where it's all at. This is where everybody needs to start taking their work and start focusing in on this point. Hmm. And Kat wants to know if you've looked into native old native languages, is there a word that sounds like Asher? That's a great question, Kat. I I have not. I haven't either. Um, Rain Stew with a great question. Was Francis Bacon Don Quixote? Um, I don't think so, uh, Rain Stew, but I, I do believe that um, Sir Walter Raleigh wrote Don Quixote uh, under the name of Cervantes. Uh, that's my take anyway. And I think we have yeah, one more cipher um, that I definitely wanted to show them because it really just hits you right in the face when you're looking at that aerial view map. Uh, what does it start with? It's the, uh, I know we have it in our folder. It'll be one of the Is last it, ones. Epilogue? No, further than that. It's in the folio. Okay, so two, page 277? Yeah, that's Epilogue. it. Got it. All right, let me pull it up for you. Yeah. So, of course, this is a uh, this is in the first folio. This is the tragedy of Hamlet. And if you look up at page 277, 27 minus seven is 20, taking numbers and making fresh numbers out of them. This is what he tells us to do in one of his sonnets. And so uh, oftentimes you're going to find air, which there are errors in this book, too, as far as the numbering. So as soon as you find it, like if you're reading the book of Hamlet and you find an error in the numbers, the rest of the numbers are worthless. Because they're not they're not correct. So you can essentially use those numbers any way you want to as you're going along through this book. And that's what's happening here. So when you get to 277, 27 minus seven gives you a new set of numbers, which is the number 20 RC. This is one way in which they'll mark a cipher. And so when you're reading this, it says, and now my lady worms chapless and knocked about the mazard with a sexton spade. A mazard is your face, a face or skull. And then, of course, of course, a sexton spade is a shovel, a grave digger shovel. OK, and it says here's fine revolution if we had the trick to see it. And of course, a trick is a cunningly way to outwit or deceive somebody or a cipher. Fine revolution. Here's fine revolution. What is a revolution? A revolution is a circle. We're talking about the circle in our cipher map. Here's fine revolution. If you have the if you have the cipher to see it. Did these bones cost no more the breeding but to play at loggets with them? Loggets was an English game in which they would take an object and throw it at a piece of wood and try to get as close to the piece of wood as they can, as his bones were just thrown into a cave next to some wood. Mine ask you to think on it. This is actually a cipher where he's describing to you the aerial view map and the fine revolution if you have that cipher. You have his, if you've gotten that far, then you have his bones. And he's asking you, did mine, is it, do you think I use those bones to just play a game with you? Now you read the next portion. It says a pickaxe and a spade. Where to, uh, where, uh, a spade for and a shrouding sheet. Well, we have that spade shovel. It was found in our cave. So what about the pickaxe? The pickaxe is the symbol that's in the map. It's the T that's just above the Y in the fine revolution if you have the trick to see it hmm. you get down to the bottom there's another why not might this be the skull of a lawyer you see that's what this is all about it's all about finding the upper half of his body and this is just one cipher telling you explaining to you what you're looking at when you are there and you have those bones in your hands the Shakespeare plays are far more than just plays, far more than just uh, creating a language. Um, the way Bacon instructed this, it could it, it's 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 structured so well, close to what we know as the inspired word, the scriptures. It, it really is. A, I, I truly believe that he was just uh, the father was with him and he had a mind unlike the, that we just 
we just can't really comprehend. I, I agree. That's 100% true about his mind. And, you know, the um, one of the uh, criticisms that people often uh, level at people who do this kind of decryption work, uh, when, you know, I started talking about the sonnets and, and some of the things that I've, I've found in them, um, one of the things that <clears throat> I, uh, you know, one of the criticisms that I always hear is you, you can't tell me that, you know, Bacon created these, you know, perfect works of art just to conceal a cipher. And I say, well, that's a specious argument and um, that you have it backwards. Uh, what he did was he wrote something that was so perfect that he knew it would stand the test of time. And then after it was written and perfected, then he encrypted ciphers within it to preserve the ciphers and the messages uh, within them and not, not the other way around. Yeah, you know, once you have so many, like I can, I can literally pull out of the uh, of the of the folio, thirty times where he's put bacon in just a simple capital letter cipher. Yeah. Now that might happen once, twice, five times in one book. You know, if you're lucky, just off a of coincidence. I mean, and and I and I'm really stretching it. I think to, he does it so many times, it can't possibly be by Fair. chance. Right. And so, you know, wh wh what's the purpose? It's 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 one of two things. Either they're just doing it to say, you know, I'm smarter than you or there's actually a purpose as to why they're doing it. But again, you know, his his ciphers were functional, like you said. They, Absolutely. They sort of so here we have our Omega symbol. Um, yes. Where, where was this in the rocks in relation to the cave you found? So this is um this has not been shown on my channel. Um, we found this all the way at the beginning, but we did not know what we were looking at. Um, we found this before we found the keystone. And so, uh, we're out there searching this mountainside, looking for, uh, what we believe is a cave because we're looking for this dot and we eventually, we find this, but then we eventually find the keystone. And once we find the keystone, it just, everything else was just, you know, and especially when we found the legs, once we found the legs, then we, we were, we weren't leaving that location. Well, now that I've, I've squeezed this map, it's brought me back around full circle. And now I'm back here at this, and this is an upside down Omega symbol. And um, we're finding out that it's actually um, it's actually part of our map. It is located, um, I'm going to say, close to maybe a thousand yards north of the Keystone. Wow. Because um, uh, one of the messages or one of the messages I decrypted from the plaque actually says, look for my tiny ox yoke uh, on stones. Oh, and yeah. And, 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 and this yoke would be this symbol. It would be an omega symbol as an ox yoke fits around their necks. Yeah, it's and a lot of uh, so people have got to ask, you know, well, why didn't they just make it the omega symbol? That's because that's an upside down omega symbol. But you have to understand, we're looking at what's referred to as the chamber of reflection, and when you begin to apply that, then it really starts opening up what you're looking at. And so that's what we're working on now. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping to be able to get you some very good news soon because I believe we are real close to unlocking this whole thing. Well, you know, Ryan, I, I really hope you do. And, um, and I really want you to come back and show us what you find uh, at the end of all of this. Um, uh, because I mean, this is, this is quite a ride. And, and like I said, um, you, you, your decryption techniques are, are completely different from mine, and yet we, we do have an overlap of, you know, certain aspects of it uh, when it comes to the keystone and the omega symbol and the way that you um, were able to get there uh, via the way you, you are, are saying you, you went there. Um, I mean, it's again, it's pretty astounding that you found um, that site based upon uh, your work here. Uh, and, you know, there's John Edwards chiming in. Did Bacon utilize scripture? Heck yes. He had us encodes the 1611 King James. Absolutely. Yes, he knew it front uh, to back. And not only did he know it, but he believed in it. And he's, he's performing. It's what he calls his six days work. 
just like the father worked in six days and then rested the seventh, he too is doing this work. He's doing it for the father and he refers to it as a six days work. And this work is it's 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 the Ark of the Covenant and it's the building of a temple. And this is all foretold in Scripture. If you were to read Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48, it's the biggest messianic uh, prophecy in the Bible. And it's all about Ezekiel seeing this third temple that's going to be showed to the world. And Bacon understood that. And I believe that when we unlock this, you're going to find a temple in this mountain that replicates those chapters. That would be amazing. <laughs> I, it, you know, unbelievable. Uh, Kat's asking, was it Marlowe? Maybe Shakespeare. That's one of the theories, Kat. But my uh, uh, my research says no. Uh, Marlowe was uh, one of the masks of uh, Shakespeare's rival poet. Um yeah, he goes into he uh, the the hero and lender is a lot about uh, he goes into mermaids, which, of course, the mermaid is half of human. You are only half a body. The many things he's doing to reference half a body, half a body, half a body. Yep. And so <clears throat> Jan's asking she wants to uh, clarify. So Bacon had his followers bring his body to the two locations of the caves and leave half in one cave and half in the other cave. And then you found it. Uh, well, no, I believe he was here. I believe he was here at the end of this, at the end of this, and he helped build it. He helped create it. And then he stayed here. His, his death is a, is a, is a, is a, is not true. As far as when they say he died, it was faked and he stayed here. And then when he died, whoever it was that he entrusted to do this, put half of his body in the cave. And then the other half is actually buried in the ground. It's in a chest. According to him, you're going to find it in a, in a, in a, in like a treasure chest. Yeah. So Tom asking a great question. How did Bacon choose this site? And did he visit personally? If not, if not, then who, and you've already said you believed that Bacon was there. Yes, I well, he I know he's using uh, Zechariah 14, 4 and 5 as to why they put it in the Ozark Mountains. Now, why they chose exactly that particular spot, maybe it's just uh, the way it's designed. Maybe it fit their needs. And and so that's where they decided they wanted to put it. And that's ultimately where they put it. But he chose the Ozark Mountains because of Zechariah 14. Uh, Zechariah 2 also talks about New Jerusalem. Um, a lot of people don't understand this, but there's actually two Jerusalems. You have the original Jerusalem, which is overseas, and then you have what's called New Jerusalem. It's in a Jerusalem that's going to be um, uh, it's going to be revealed at the end of days. And when you're reading Zechariah two, this is a description of it. And he tells them to run. He says, "For for Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls, due to the multitude of men and cattle therein." And when you come out here, that's all there is is cattle, farmland, and people. Yeah. Uh, again, and Kat asking a great question. The absolute proof is to find the rest of them. So uh, where, you, where do you think he is? And where's the ark? She wants to know. So the so the body, we believe, is where that symbol was, the Y with the T. Um, there's too much water during the winter. It's so close to that creek that when the water rises, it will flood that. And 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 then with all the rain and everything we get, we've got a lot of ice and snow. So there's just it's too much moisture in the ground. Every time you take a, a scoop of dirt out, water will just come up. Now, like I said, according to him, he, he claims that he found a way to keep water out for a great while. Now, if it's just his bones and he says there's a, a, a bunch of gold with him. So if it's just bones and gold, it really doesn't matter if it gets wet or not. But if you had writings in there with you, then you would want to preserve that to where it didn't get wet. It's in a location where you would just never think a person would put their body there. But according to this map, if we're reading it correctly, this is exactly where he says he is. And so this summer, when the water level goes down, we're going to get the equipment. We're going to get the diggers out there. And we're going to dig up the whole thing. We're going to go 10 feet deep. We're going to dig up the whole area and we'll wow. either find them or not. <laughs> now, now the true. Ark of the Covenant, the temple, it's in the temple. We have to find the entrance into that temple. And I believe we have found that entrance. We're working it now. We're going to find out if it's true or not. Um, for me, there is no, there's too much evidence. I know it's here. Now, as far as getting in, that's proving to be difficult. It's not done with logic. You actually have to, you actually, there is a formula that you have to follow. It's what Bacon refers to as basically rising to the just weights. And, he, and, and basically what he says is you're going to have to persevere. You're going to have to walk into these traps, into these tricks, into these things. We're going to make you think that it's one thing, but then it's going to end up being something else. And you have to do this. And if you persevere, 
You will overcome darkness and you will be enlightened. Wow. I think that's a great way to finish off our podcast here this evening. That was, <laughs> that was a, a mic drop moment, my friend. <laughs> um, uh, AO is, uh, and again, I want to leave with his comment as well. He says, I agree with Tom. He voted. I, you don't know this, uh, Ryan, but I, uh, I just I started a new thing tonight where I put a poll up on uh, the YouTube side. Of, it showed up as, as an option and never has before. And so I, I, I asked, do you think Francis Bacon brought the Ark to America? Uh, yes or no? And um, here we have AO at, um, stating, I agree with Tom. I voted no in that poll. And after listening to this live stream, there seems to be no doubt that Francis Bacon was indeed in America. Yes, you can actually you can actually see that in all the drawings In all of the drawings you'll notice uh, generally they'll have like uh, it's where it's it's Noah's Ark and it's floating on water like coming over and they'll have a depiction of America on the other side. It's referring to the Ark, not Noah's Ark, but the Ark of the Covenant. They're, it's a way right. of them letting you know we've brought the Ark over to North America. Yep. So. Once again, um. John's asking if Bacon arrived after he faked his own death, what year would you put his arrival? Um, I, John, if you look at the timeline um, in one of the last chapters of my first book, uh, I believe I, I, I pinpointed there. I don't know what it is off the top of my head. What, what would you say, Ryan? I, I have never been able to pinpoint that. According, if, if this is all true and we know it is, we know for sure. When you find when you find his body and when you find that temple, those answers will be there. He will detail exactly, you know, how all this played out. Now, if I was to take a logical guess, I'm looking at events and I see an event in I don't know the exact year, but there was two ships that came over called the Hopewell and the Chancewell. Mm -hmm. It only had two men per per crew, which the I believe it says up to six to a dozen is what they would normally use. And so that to me is very strange, very strange. Um, you also have the, the Mayflower itself in which you had a man on there by that went by the name of Francis Cook. He's numbered. He's, he's number 17 on the Mayflower compact ledger, which of course is a signpost for bacon. And then this Francis Cook supposedly goes back to Europe and then comes back a year later on a, on a ship called the Annie. Annie Cook was his, supposedly made uh, uh, adopted mother's maiden name. And so you kind of have these breadcrumbs is, you know, is that proof? No, it's not. But it really like, it, it really was like a signpost. Like, you know, there could be something here. So I don't know exactly when he came over, but we do know that he came over. Yeah. And, and um, you know, I, I definitely have him in Nova Scotia and uh, new France um, before and after he faked his own death. Um, and so, maybe they maybe they put this here long before 1600, and it, and he's just healthy. you know they that, that that part of the work's already done, and he's now implementing it into the book into the 1611 and the folios and everything, and then towards the end of his life he just comes out and 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 he's here. Um, I've been under the mindset of somehow they got over here in 1600 and did all this work, but just by looking at the site, I mean it's going to take several years to do what you've done here. Yeah, yeah, and um. And lots of men, many men would have had to have helped him. Well, when you recognize that uh, these are guys who were operating under uh, aliases uh, and uh, at a, a few points in their lives, they each had their own fleet of ships and therefore sailors, uh, along with the fact that um, they were disciples of uh, Sir Francis Drake. Um, you know, you, you have a tradition there of, of That's exploring. Another exploring and, and, you know, seafaring and, and having a large group of, of, uh, workers. That's so. another, that's another aspect what we have here. We, um, because it's, when you look it up in Asher, it's called lawyer's Creek, but it didn't used to be called that. It originally was called Drake's Creek and it ha actually has a sign out here. It says Drake's Creek and the a is a compass and ruler. And so they're correlating with this Freemasonry. I truly believe that it was in reference to Francis Drake. Somehow he is tied to this. Uh, again, you know, you keep surprising me. Um, and yeah, Daniel, uh, he, Drake was definitely in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and Tom saying that manpower not be, uh, an issue for someone of his status. That's absolutely true. 
So, well, listen, gang, um, gone a little bit over here tonight, but we're going to wrap things up. And listen, Ryan, um, I want to invite you back as soon as you either find something or don't. You know, either way, I want you to keep us uh, updated. Uh, let us know what you find. Uh, people who are watching this here live or people who uh, watch the, the recording later online, you know, just know that, um, you know, we uh, on this show, I, I love to have, um, you know, people with uh, alternative viewpoints, uh, people who know me. And I, I've never really taken a stand on it, but they know that uh, from the beginning, I, I've always uh, kind of uh, I, I never believed that the Ark of the Covenant came came to either Nova Scotia or or the America. Um, and, you know, I have very good reasons, uh, uh, for that. And yet here we have Ryan presenting this information tonight. Um, and I have to say at each turn, Ryan, I, I was, I was really pretty impressed at, at the way you brought up certain key points that, uh, made me think, well, that re that overlaps and corroborates some of my findings as well. And, yeah. and so there, there, there is, you know, uh, that's how you know it's real. That's how you know it's this. This is real. Well, we, that that's just it, and that's what we try to do on the shows. We try to corroborate uh, or or refute. You know, if we yep. have information that that says no, I think it's this. You know, we we present it, and likewise, uh, people do the same. They say, well, this is what I think happened here, and yep. so that's what I think is going to really um, really reveal uh, the truth of what's going on here. And so, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, and I really want you to come back, uh, after the spring, after you do your ex your big dig and excavation, because this, it, it's regardless of, gang, listen, whether you uh, believe it's here or not, or whether you, um, you know, whatever your viewpoint is, you, there's no disputing, uh, Ryan, you have made a major find here and, and it was these ciphers that led you to that find. Yes. Um, and so. Uh, I great job, great presentation tonight. Uh, your your command of of uh, the scriptures is imposing uh, and impressive, uh, and so can't wait to have you back and uh, let us know how you how you made out, my friend. Thank you very much. If you guys want to know more detail about the ciphers, just go to my YouTube channel. I really do lay out many many videos of these ciphers, and I go into much more detail with them, and so you'll be able to get a lot more and be able to understand even more if you choose to. Yeah, go to um, YouTube and do a search for Ryan Plaster, P-L-A-S-T-E-R. Let, ev let everybody know. <laughs> yeah, and let everyone know, you know, hit the like button and uh, bring more people in. Uh, thanks for staying with us, gang. And yes, we're definitely going to have Ryan back for part two. Uh, Ryan, I'm going to put you out here in the waiting room and I'm going to give my Jerry Springer final thought and sign off. You have a good night. Thanks, buddy. So, wow. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, like I said, um, thanks, Curtis. You know, I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm one of those people that I've, I've always been skeptical of, of the ARC story. Uh, and yet here's Ryan saying something. And at every turn, as he, he was explaining how he went from point A to point B. Um, and one of the things that, you know, I, I give Ryan the benefit of the doubt simply because uh, I know how this works. I know how the cipher work uh, works. And, and like I said, you know, he's using methods completely different from me. But uh, for me to go through and explain step by step to all of you how I arrive at a decryption, um, I, all of you know this if you've watched my show for a while, it's it's labor intensive and um, and can be tedious and god awful boring. And what Ryan did was there there were certain areas where I thought he kind of glossed over things and didn't connect it out, but it's because it's just so massive, as he said, and it is. Um, uh, you know, trying to take everyone along, you know, connecting all the dots uh, for you. It's not always easy. And so um, I really want to say, um, you know, I, I, I'm far more impressed. I mean, I, I, I've, I've been impressed by Ryan for uh, a while, not just talking to him, but uh, the way he just kind of broke that down for us. I, it was really, really interesting stuff. It's an interesting interpretation, and I can't wait to have him back to see what he finds. So um, in the meantime, uh, I'm going to be signing off here and I want to say thanks for showing up as usual. I appreciate you guys. This is why we do this. It's always a lot of fun. And, uh, until next time, a couple of weeks from now, uh, just be cool to each other and I'll see you next time. Night all.